So we have this. So welcome everybody again. Um, excited to have you here. Uh, if you have any specific questions, this is a really great time to, to share that. Uh, Megan and I can talk about a few things for sure as, as well. Um, I'm sure some people will continue to join in. Um, that's what uh, they did uh, last week on, on our Wednesday call. Um, so if you have anything that you'd like to share and you'd like to put into a chat, that's great. Um, you can also, we can also grab the mic if you, if you have anything that you'd like to discuss um, related to the course content or related to anything that, you know, questions you have as you move on to your next term. Um, I know that, um, you know, our, our university is currently transitioning still. Um, we ha had the fully remote in the spring and, you know, I'm, I'm based out of Texas. And we helped uh, the summer session move online fully as well. And in the fall, we're going to have a, a mix. And that's one of the things that we sort of talk about in that, in that last unit is sort of moving on. There's going to be some people that are fully online, some people that are going to be pretty much mostly on campus, and then others are going to have sort of a hybrid mix. But I know for us, like our, our university is going to end at, uh, will be our Thanksgiving time. So in November, when we would normally go up through the second week of December. So... Um, anything after that's going to be just fully, fully online. No, there's going to be nothing else on campus. Um, so you need to do a final. All the finals would be considered. You know, you'd have to have it before the Thanksgiving break, or it would be uh, be online. So yeah, a lot of a lot of changes you know, to the way that we normally run our long semesters. I mean, we have a lot of uh, dynamic start dates and things like that. But um, that, that pop you know throughout throughout the year. Sometimes they'll start in in August, sometimes we'll start in October. It sort of depends for five week, eight week courses, but for the most part for the, the long semesters. Yeah, it's gonna be a change at our university. What about you, Megan? How's how are things looking at UNESA? Yeah, um, so I'm in Australia, so a slightly different situation. Um, largely that we've been able to, at least in my state, South Australia, get COVID under um, control um, right now. So. Our semesters also work differently from from the states. So um, we are just finishing up our semester now. So our students are doing um, their fully online exams right now. Um, so this is considered the first semester of the year for us because we follow the calendar year. Um, and then our second semester will start um, at the end of July. And so right now um, we're all basically working from home. Um, all classes went fully online and exams are fully online. Um, but from next semester, um, what we've been told is we're actually going to be heading back to campus. Everything except lectures um, will be face to face. Um, there might there'll probably be some tutorials um, where um, lecturers think, uh, you know, we can probably do this online. Um, but, and the full lectures will be face to face, but it, everything else some tutorials, definitely the labs and the practicals and that sort of thing would be um, back on campus. Um, and they've been generally the harder ones as well to shift online and for many of our subjects, um, that some of them put on hold, delayed until next semester, um, just because they have been really hard to do, you know, for you know, teaching physio, for example, um, some of our nursing, some of our nursing we could do online, but some of it's obviously harder. So a lot of those sorts of practical type courses are going back to face-to-face -to -face, um, and just moving everything basically except lectures at this point has gone back to face-to-face -to -face for next semester, which means our, um, our instructors now need to start thinking about what that looks like. Um, we had a really rapid quick you know you got two weeks move online um this past semester and now it's time to think about what that next semester looks like especially for those who are doing the lectures because now they have time to think through a little bit and plan ahead of what that would look like online in the k-12 context too i know that there are still a lot of changes that are going on i know i know in my region there are a lot a lot of the school districts that we would have uh, are, are offering different tracks. Typically it's going to be a fully online track or a fully on campus track and you can have the ability to, to move back and forth between the two. So it's going to be interesting to see how the districts make sure that you can maintain and, and it's curious because they haven't been able to share yet. Is it going to be the same teacher that you are going to have two different things that you're going to have to teach at the same time? 
I'm seeing right now is it's like a high flex or is it going to be like an asynchronous model? It, it, it's interesting. They haven't, they haven't shared all that information yet. So I'm, I'm curious how, you know, teachers are going to be able to adapt to some of these things. But it's a, it's, it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting phenomenon that we're going through right now. I mean, I know our district did a great job of, um, cause I have, a, I have a second grader it's going into third grade now and they did a great job you know, sharing hot spots, making sure people had hot lunches. If you needed to pick up packets, you could do that. But for the most part, everything was ungraded. And we were just, um, you know, just trying to get through through the semester. But I know that we got an email from a superintendent is like, we're going to have rigor, you know, we're going to make sure that we have you know, the content and we're going to have grades and, and all that. So I'm kind of curious how, you know, some of these things are going to work out. I mean, I, I think that they need to, but how do you do that and how do you do that effectively, especially when students are going back and forth I mean, especially if you have an illness in your family and then, you know, for, you have a whole class that someone has positive for COVID and then how do you respond from there? Well, but I think, you know, one of the biggest things obviously is, is we, keep, we keep championing this is, you know, having flexibility I and mean, then having a culture of care too and just realizing, holy cow, we have to get through this all together. <laughs> so, uh, so Jane, yes, I see that you're going full, fully online. Okay. Okay. Yeah. February. Um, how are they supporting you for that? Are you are you getting like full um, trainings? Are you are you being told that you have to offer you know one specific way versus another? I've heard some places that are trying to do you know still this full synchronous. Um, absolutely, yeah. Go ahead and use audio. Okay, so hi everyone. Um, yeah, I work in London and we're based at uh, Wembley Stadium, so the National Stadium. So I work at the university campus of football business so we're football specific so okay. without football and and uh, supporters and things it's everything's been a bit on hold but um yeah we made the decision we've been online since um march and then that was just tidying up the end of the semester so now we're moving fully online um we're going with microsoft teams they made that decision so that was the first one because they thought it was going to be safer so for us it's now you know we're trying to get some annual leave in <laughs> before we start but um yeah it's just trying to get your head around all the different functionalities of things because teams we've used for meetings and things but suddenly you know i'm thinking oh i've got a class of 100 uh, all on teams and it's i don't know with timetabling still because i think that's really important to have a schedule but it's then thinking how am i going to make out these breakout rooms and make it interactive and and try and be as engaging, create a community because I find that so important. Um, how can I bring myself into the computer, I suppose, to try and engage them? So it's ideas around that that I'm I'm really interested. We have like probably two hour usually on content and then two hour seminars. So I have about four hours to play with, with bringing other people in as well. But I'm really interested in the way you guys use mini videos. It's not something we've used before, but I was thinking maybe going with the 20 minute content and then but I don't know how to do that. I've never done that. So that sort of thing, how I can create stuff, maybe that's, there's just me, I'm at home, based at home, obviously, and have been for some time. So it's, I've got remote tech support, but that's about it. <laughs> yeah, I, I would suggest, Jane, that you do consider doing some videos. So you said that typically it's two hours of um, content and two hours of activity. So the two hours of activity is when you could use Teams, that would be great, um, and using the breakout features and getting students to answer problems together or having discussions together and then bringing it from the small breakout room back to the larger group, um, ensuring that yourself as the teacher, as a facilitator, you're jumping in and out of the different breakout rooms. Um, I've heard that when sometimes if students go into a breakout room and the instructions aren't very clear they get lost really quickly and they don't know what to do so it's important to be really clear with what you want them to do in the breakout rooms and also for you to just jump in and out to see how they're going um but in terms of the content part like i know you said it's scheduled for four hours but i wonder if it could be considered that the two hours they come into teams and they do those sort of um online activities and the other two hours is spent watching videos because you don't necessarily want to use Teams to just talk at them, um, especially 100 students. Um, it's designed more for those smaller groups doing those kind of conversations, but instead you could do, like you said, those um, chunked up shorter videos. Um, and, you know, depending on what you have on your computer, you might have 
you know, even teams you could probably use and just hit record and use that as a way to create a video. And then you could put it on any sort of um, streaming server if your institution provides it. If not, you could put it on YouTube and just put it as unlisted and share the link with your students. Oh, okay. And then just filming it, you just record yourself then as you would do. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, so just like for so right now we're using Zoom um, to have this chat today, but Teams is more or less the same. It's pretty similar, um, similar concept. So, but instead of you know having a number of people in in Teams with you, just like you said, you used used it for meetings. It would just be yourself, and you could hit the record button. That's that's the, the simplest way, I guess, in terms of making a recording. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Otherwise, um, if you have access to other tools for making recordings whether it's something like panopto or um you know if you have a mac it usually comes with some sort of recording software um, windows usually has um, movie player or something like that that you could create a video oh okay i think all of those things are useful because uh, i know it can do interviews and other people i know will contribute so i can get people to do you know and that in a way that's that's uh, made it um, easier for us because we're getting guest lectures in is always quite difficult as you can you know trying to get them physically into the space so I think we've got access to be able to which is great so some of the collaboration I think could be good but um, yeah it's just that suddenly thinking I wanted to you know it's almost I suppose the initial thought was creating the lecture online and of course that's really not what it is is it it's knowing the most important content I mean I'm mostly masters as well so it is easier in relation to a lot of the discussion stuff they're very good at interacting in discussions but well they are usually in the classroom so it's just trying to get that back up and making sure it works it's it's really pivotal isn't it and the inductions we're talking about that you know new students coming in obviously master students are all new but um, you know, how do we make that so we, it can, you know, that they're excited about studying and they're meeting everybody and, mm -hmm. and they're part of this, this, this community. I think I'm really so, not struggling, but really trying to think about how we can make that engaging. And, and so any ideas on those sorts of fronts are, are really helpful. So a couple other thoughts that I have is, so you could chunk your videos and you could, if you're doing like even a synchronous time too, you could show something like say five, seven minutes and then have them go into their groups, discuss things, and then come back, discuss it as sort of a larger group as well, and then chunk it, you know, that way as well. Um, not even, you know, if you do it asynchronously, you could do synchronously, you know, depending how you wanted to do it, but sort of sort of breaking things up and, and moving it around. But one thing that I think is also sometimes really useful, um, especially in, in these kind of the environment that we're in right now is really build some good scaffolding in place. So if there are particular questions or instructions that I want students to be able to do, um, sometimes I will go and list those things in advance and I will share that and say, so in this session, here are the things that we're going to cover today. And so if you do have a question, you can refer back to this or, you know, make sure to ask questions for that. Um, sometimes I've, I've found that that's helped students stay in so they don't also don't have the excuse either. I mean, they can, you know, be able to go and navigate out to that. Or, um, you know, you just make sure to be very clear about, you know, that you want them to, to be engaging with that. So anyway, just yeah. some thoughts with that. Scaffolding online can be can be a big challenge for some for, for some learners, I, you know, depending on the context that, that you're in. Because um, you know, I've done a lot of crazy <laughs> designs with, with, with my courses. I can talk a little more about that at, at some point. But essentially trying to scaffold learners to have more of like a traditional way that our students would learn where it's, it's very sort of what we call instructivist pathway where I tell them you know here's how you can move through the content here's how you can interact whereas allowing them to have more autonomy and agency and the cho yeah. and, and choice and things like that so um and, and trying to scaffold both of those environments in the same course and that's and that, that can be definitely challenging and then you, you sort of notice that people tend to gravitate towards the thing that they're being told to do because that's kind of what they have been doing but yeah. when you yeah. think about lifelong learning and the workforce things like that you have to be able to reskill on your own and build yeah. you know figure out how you learn well and learn where to find you know the resources and how to evaluate them and things like that so um so absolutely but that requires a lot of support and changing the way that that are you know we're sometimes we're even wired after yeah. you know 20 years of school <laughs> yeah we are, so and judy has a question around the use of perusal and hypothesis um so 
I haven't used perusal or hypothesis too much. Um, I certainly haven't used perusal, but I have doubled with hypothesis um, and for higher level English lit courses. Um, I have heard that they have both of those have been used for um, for language courses in particular um, as, as as ways to essentially be able to um, look at a piece of writing and comment on it. Um, but I don't know them too, too well in order to be able to give too much advice around them. Justin, have you come across them? Yeah, more? we've used it a little bit for, for certain uh, certain courses, certain activities that we've done too. In fact, we even presented about this at the Online Learning Consortium Conference uh, Innovate last week a little bit. Um, we, we did sort of the, like a fun game of, um, there's this uh, chopped challenge <laughs> where you, oh, yeah, um, yeah okay. that, that show where you get all these sort of mystery ingredients and so one of ours was was this hypothesis was sort of like the main ingredient but then we had three other oh, ones, okay. like okay. cat bounce where the cats are going to throw them around and that sort of thing and, and, and sort of thinking about how you oops, sorry, this one trying to win. um yeah so it, it, we had a, a couple other ones as well and i'm um, trying to think about how to how to use that effectively and so so one of the things we we thought about for is it was sort of oh one of them was like a random the random useless website you know, sort of thing. So you click on that generator, and it takes you out to, to wherever um, you know, and you can you know, play around with that with that website. So, so sometimes it's gonna be a little more PG thirteen, but um, but for, for for the context of that, um, what a lot of the the groups thought of, um, I know, I know one of them I thought was really interesting was supporting students and and wellness and well being. So we all sort of do like waste time wasting activities, and we're processing a lot right now. So I mean, why else would you have cat bounce, right? But, um, but one thing that um, some of the groups came up with was, you know, thinking about themselves and doing reflective writing and sharing, like, so why would I use this? Why would I go to this thing over this other thing and, and engage in conversations with each other? And so I mean, there, there are definitely ways that, that you can set it up and it obviously it overlays on top of an existing web page that's out there. So, so there's a lot, I mean, you can pretty much do it for anything, which, which is really great. And then there are a lot of great resources out there. So, um, you know, I could see this um, being, I didn't, I have never used a history course that I taught, but I could absolutely see that where people can go and pick apart because there are definitely some, some resources out there that are terrible <laughs> that you go to and you're like holy cow wow um like this is a site you want to avoid and, and you but, but i can have them sort of think about that process and work through it together as well um so i, I can see that maybe being useful for for sites i mean that poetry and discussing poetry or I don't know, if you have open sites or even youtube you know pages maybe like slam you know those sorts of things i i don't know the exact way that, that you're interested in doing it but um but but absolutely i, I see it's, it's a it's a good tool for collaboration and i know a lot of people that, that do use it and use it you know quite well um and again i think I think it's just sort of in the way that you sort of design it but it's absolutely it's, it's, a, it's a great collaboration that you can overlay on, on anything so Good. Well, Judy, hopefully that gave you some suggestions. Um, Lizelle, absolutely, you can use audio to ask your question. Okay. Hello, everyone. Very nice meeting you. Hi. Hi. Okay. So now my main problem is I work in an vocational institution uh, with Niagara College. And uh, uh, the problem here that the vocational institution uh, here is like uh, after the secondary school and actually uh, the students are the students who are not accepted in the higher education universities, which means they are a little bit, I can describe them like uh, weak students who were refused or who were declined from higher educa uh, education institution or university. Uh, so they are not motivated enough and uh, they are not willing to learn like if i have a class with 24 students maybe maximum four students are really uh, motivated they what they they know what why they are uh, uh, why they are learning or whatever so of course when uh, i struggled more when we uh, pivoted online uh, i already struggled in the class when i try to um uh, to convince them that it's a vocational institution, is a student center uh, institution. Uh, there are always not only uh, for me ten minutes maximum that I have to talk. So, but they 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 couldn't understand that the responsibility mainly is on them. So imagine having this in line. So I finished my semester now. We are on vacation, but really uh, I wasn't productive at all with them online. I struggled with everything. So I was wondering if there is any uh, specific like. Uh, 
a technologies that I can use to deal with unmotivated students or, or approaches or whatever. Um, so I wouldn't jump into the technology right away. Um, maybe look at, so I'm, I don't know what subject you teach necessarily. Uh, business. business. Yeah, business. business. Okay. Yeah. Um, so after they take your course, they probably take some more courses, but I suppose their goal um, is to get um, a job, you know, start the career yeah. business. Yeah, so that's the, the ultimate goal. So maybe t um, starting from that in the sense that, um, and trying to use that as a way to motivate them to engage with the course, um, bringing in examples from um, the business industry, um, talking about the types of jobs that they might do, and then the activities that you design or the assessments as well that you design in the course to relate it as much as possible to, um, to that goal, to that future career or that future job. Um, it's one way to do it. Um, the other way to do it, again, just because if that's the goal, that's why they took, that's why they're enrolled. Um, and if that's really, maybe their only prime driver is, you know, they want to get a job in the end of it, um, is really bringing that to the forefront of the course, potentially. Um, and then as well, if you want them to do any sort of group work um, sort of things, then you can also bring that in in respect to, again, the types of skills they'll need when they say um, interview for a job or when they apply mm -hmm. for a job. And so bringing it back to how, um, what you're trying to do in the class relates and prepares them for being so successful and getting a job in the future. So, in, you know, when they're working in business, it's unlikely they're going to work independently on their own, not talking to anyone. They probably have to talk with peers. They probably have to um, do projects and groups with others, you know, other colleagues at work. So you're trying to bring in some of that into um, the courses that you teach. That would be my suggestion in terms of trying to motivate that particular um, type, uh, audience of okay. students that you have. Okay, Justin, thank you. Justin, do you have anything? To yeah, another thought to our, um, just, yeah, trying to identify what their goals are at the beginning too. Um, I've, I've worked with that with, with, with my students uh, where they, at the beginning of say each unit, you, but you could do it at the beginning of the course as well. And I mean, you co-create, you know, some, some mutual goals for the course and things that you want to do. So maybe you have certain parts that are structured, but certain parts that you can be a little bit less structured about and allow some, some freedom um, and some, uh, to be able to bring stuff that they're really super interested in. So, you know, maybe if they really want to bring in somebody like they, they work with, um, somebody somewhere else that they want to be able to bring them in as a guest speaker or something like that and that can be a bigger component or they have some you know article or something that they found online that they really want to come in and bring it and be able to discuss that as it relates to the course and 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 things like that that kind of gives them a little bit more control of something that they're interested in something that they're already looking at um too sometimes you know it, it doesn't have to be a huge part of the course but say you dedicate you know 20 minutes to it um, out of it you know if you have an hour and a half yeah like that. yeah got it yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Marvie. Socratic, yeah. <laughs> <Was it worth laughs> <that naked? laughs> yeah. Um, so Marvi, great question um, on how to incorporate the Socratic method of inquiry online. Um, as I'm sure you, you probably experienced doing it face to face and it could be challenging doing it online. Um, so from my understanding, um, and I'm not an expert in Socratic method of inquiry at all, um, but my understanding of it is um, there's quite a bit of debate, argument, questioning, answering um, that occurs and um, which, which is, you know, um, a great method of teaching um, in the humanities, um, absolutely, and probably some social sciences as well. Um, so I would say you could model it using Zoom. If so if the modeling of it, you could use Zoom, you could have a colleague on the other side of your Zoom conversation, and you can use it that way. Um, when you want to ask your students, then um, you could do it in in two different ways. Um, you could do it asynchronously using a discussion forum. 
Um, or you can use, again, something like Zoom or Teams or something like that to get students to, to answer questions um, and probe questions and that sort of thing. And I'm, yeah. yeah. I can see like a synchronous chat too, if you need to do yeah. sometimes as well for some people, if, if they are having challenges with the bandwidth, um, perhaps it's something you can explore if you had something like Teams or if you had something like, uh, like a Zoom use Slack or another one of those, you know, collaborative tools. Um, that might be another way of doing it. I'm curious how large your classes are, too, and that could also... Yeah, the size, for sure. I mean, I guess you could put people into groups, yeah. um, depending on so the size. I was curious if you have large classes, you have 100, 150, yeah. like that, and obviously there's, there's some huge challenges to being able to do that, but I'm curious if you have, you know, smaller class sizes, 10, 15, obviously it lends itself more to, to be able to do stuff like that as, a, as an entire class, as opposed to, yes, using like a breakout feature. Um, but then again, it's, you'd have to have someone that could be a good facilitator for some of those conversations. That could be a challenge. If you're really breaking them down, you'd have to hop in between, I'm sure, a lot of them. So just, I think that really depends on the, on the class size. And, and I hate to say that sometimes people see online, or quite online courses with, with large, <laughs> Um, we think of like a MOOC like this where we have 2,000 people <laughs> that register for it, but again, it's what their intentions are. It doesn't have to be. It could be exactly. small classes. I've taught small classes online. Um, so I also wonder whether it's something that has to be synchronous or whether it could be asynchronous mm -hmm. um, or a mix of the two um, where, you know, certain types of questions are posed and they're answered by a discussion forum. Um, and the, or students prepare their answer in groups, maybe if they can do it in groups. You know, I'm just thinking in terms of like doing a debate. Um, if they're put into groups, then they have to research and come up with their answer or their argument um, and then pose it um, either synchronously then as a te in, in, te in teams or Zoom or whatever, mm -hmm. um, or even still asynchronously in the discussion forum. So you could do it that way as well. Um, if it doesn't have to be synchronous, um, it might be um, useful to do it asynchronously in that way. You, you don't have to worry about access issues um, mm -hmm. and all the other um, challenges with having students come in synchronously. Nobody misses out. Um, everyone's able to do it asynchronously. Mm -hmm. Another thing too is, is you may not also have to have everybody do that in every course if you could have certain groups do it too. So you could have you know one group of 10 you know do it one week and then the next week another group would do it and then people can kind of listen in and provide their additional thoughts and feedback as well. Um, so that that's yeah I mean, I've seen that at, yeah used in, in some, some online but even doctoral classes yeah to be able to yeah, get, yeah. get some sort of engagement. Does that help? Yeah, hope, hope that helps, Marby. If yeah. not, ask us with further questions, but thank you, it does. All right, cool. Okay. <laughs> not that uh, uh, yeah, any other? Have any questions? Mm -hmm. One person. Yeah. One person keeps coming back in and out. I don't know if they're having technical issues or not. But. Uh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Asynchronous chat. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds like an excellent idea. Um, you can certainly do an asynchronous chat. It's um, easier on your students as well. Um, get them to prepare perhaps that way and then bring them together for um, the live, the live portion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's good to think about um, the blend so that courses aren't purely one or the other. Um, I'm finding a lot of people are right now is a lot of focus on the synchronous. So it's good to be thinking about how you can do things asynchronously as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yep, especially absolutely. if you have a lot of internet outages too and things. Yeah, it's, it's good to be able to build multiple ways of being able to come into the content. So Deanna has a question around where to start to learn about instructional design. <laughs> you probably know better that better than me. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's certainly um, 
a range of MOOCs on the topic yeah. um, that you could start with for sure. Um, so, um, you know, if you search for MOOCs on learning to teach, um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be about online, but a lot of them happen to be. Um, so there's definitely a range of different MOOCs out there on different platforms. Um, taking an edX class in July, finish my edX in November. All right, cool. Oh, cool. Um, Congrats. Yes, that's great. <laughs> Um, yeah, so there's a range of, there's definitely a range of MOOCs out there um, that cover various topics around educational design and instructional design. Um, so that's, that's an entry level starting point, I, I, I would say. Um, and then from there, there's formal programs and courses on it for sure. Um, and a lot, well, it's on Insta, I guess. There's a difference between instruct learning about instructional design and um, how to design an online course, I guess, or how to design a course. Because a lot of institutions have their, like a lot of universities, for example, would have their own um, professional development courses for their instructors in terms of how to design their courses that they can take. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of things being available, there's some there's some decent books out there too. Um, I can share after yeah. um that is especially if you're interested in, in some of the theory behind the designs and, and why you know some ways are better than you know others for certain contexts and and how you can adjust and adapt things and like that i think that um that, that that can be something that can be useful and i have a couple in the other room i can go and pull them out when it's not seven in the morning <laughs> trying to remember everything but um, yeah, I definitely have some. I was, I was an instructional designer for about two years. Um, and I, I kind of went into a transition from another position. So I don't have as, as big of a background, but Matt, Matt Crossland, I know is one of the instructors in the course. So I'm like, also ping him to see if he has any good thoughts or resources for this. And he's, he's continuing to be an instructional designer for, well, gosh, he's been there for 10, 15 years, as well as a researcher. Um. Jane has a great question around motivating students to read articles within the lecture setting and then discuss it. Um, so um, one way that I found has worked fairly well for many people um, in various disciplines um, to do that is um, it's kind of called a flipped classroom approach, um, which can be done online with the online flipped classroom, where you ask them to do the readings ahead of time and they come to class, supposedly having finished them to prepare, and then they do a sort of problem or sort of activity with each other in class based on the readings that they had done prior. Um, with that though, um, what I've found, um, and a lot of my colleagues have found, um, teaching colleagues, is that it's actually more effective if those readings that you've given them have like an activity to do, like some questions to do, even if it's like a little self-test, you know, something like that, or a little quiz, um, and then it depends whether you want to give them a mark for that or not. Um, but that usually encourages them to do the readings as well. Um, so if you have some readings, or if you and it works with video as well, if you want them to watch a video, um, and often students don't bother reading or watching the video prime to coming to your lecture time is to, you know, you give them those sort of activities, build around like a little quiz for them to do around that um, prior to coming to your lecture time and then using that lecture time to do those sort of discussions um, and activities will then help. It'll take a bit of time and it's for students to get used to that this is the way that you've set up your teaching. Um, but it certainly does motivate them once they know that, one, there's quiz questions to do, but secondly, that they need to come to class prepared because they're letting their team down. So if you've got them working in teams, and it usually actually works better if they're in the same team for a while because they start to build rapport with one another in the team and then they start to feel um, a bit of that social norming in terms of they'll feel bad if they don't come to class prepared because they're getting to know their team members. Um, but it does take a bit of time um, to set it up and for them to start to understand that. But that's um, certainly one way that you could motivate them to do readings. Um, and also the quiz questions prior to coming to that time is useful for you because if you look at um, 
the results, then you'll know what sort of concepts they have understood and which ones they're struggling with. And then if you needed to, you could build in a little mini lecture or um, talk through the challenging um, concepts with your students. So Deanna, uh, Diana says it was helpful to build in time for students to report back to the whole group after the, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so um, problem out there, they discuss it and make, yeah, ensuring that there's time for them to report back on, uh, on what they have come up with. Or even if it's a problem that's, um, that has a correct answer or an incorrect answer, it's still coming back to then um, find out whether they answered it correctly or not as a group is, is worthwhile and worthwhile to have that discussion. Yeah, I agree. Right. Mm -hmm. Any other final questions? Mm -hmm. Adam or Jose, if you had anything, or if you just want to listen in, that's fine too. So I will say that uh, if you have any further questions, yes, please continue to use those um, module forums. Um, and we'll keep we'll keep an eye on those. I went through them again last night. And, um, if you uh, you know have anything else that you know would like to share, we're trying to keep those as, as much as possible. Um, and keep, you know, I'm trying to at least stay on it at least once a week. So um, if you if you have anything specific, I know some people ask things Matt and Tanya specifically. I'll try to make sure to always flag those. I'm probably going to be the person in the, in the course of the most flagging and sending those things to the instructors. Please. But you know if you if you have any of those questions, you know. We all have another session next week. It'll be, um, in this case, it'll be like 6 p.m. U.S. Central Time, and then the following week we'll do it at this time again. Maybe I'll be at this one. So we'll always have at least two instructors, and we'll try to provide a variety of um, responses that we that we can. And you know, but again, please use those forms in, in the meanwhile, and and please feel free to share if you have experiences or thoughts. I mean, uh, we we all have different experiences. In, in you know that we bring to the table here and and we definitely Megan and I don't know everything <laughs> but I think we include it. we're talking about Socratic we we've used I mean I know I've used it you know once in K-12 teaching many years ago but I haven't used that in quite a while but but definitely if you have some experiences and thoughts share with others and participate with others we encourage you to do that and, um, you know you put as much into the course that you feel like like you can and you know being a self-paced course you know it's, it's a little bit different in terms of the way the structure is, in terms of you know our instructor-led course you know, is a little bit tighter with the time frame, so you're going to have people that are sort of coming in and out a little bit more. But um, we hope that you're able to get some good things out of it. And if there's if you have no other questions, you know, thanks for joining us, and I hope you have a good rest of your day. Yeah. Hope to and, see you next time. Yeah. Enjoy your day. Enjoy your evening, wherever you may be. Yeah.